defense is, is one that people talk about a lot, and it has been a part of some big trials historically. Yeah, it has. And so we spent the day uh, digging up some of the best cases that I think would illustrate uh, the pros and cons of it, when it works, when it doesn't. And the granddaddy of all the cases was John Hinckley, who back in 1981 uh, shot the president, President Ronald Reagan. Everybody remembers, Vinny, where they were when they heard the news that President Reagan had been shot. He survived. Um, but then the name John Hinckley became ubiquitous. Everybody knew that name. It happened on March 30th, 81. As I said, I think I was 14 or 15, but, you know, that was a century ago. Um, and he did this to impress Jodie Foster. He was fascinated, just completely transfixed by the actress Jodie Foster, and especially after her role in Taxi Driver. Uh, and to impress her, he went out, you know, he, he went out to, to, to shoot the president. He fired six rounds at the Hilton Hotel in D.C., where President Reagan uh, had been giving a speech. And he fired into Reagan's left lung. Um, he also fired into press secretary James Brady's head. James Brady was uh, terribly injured and paralyzed for life. Um, he also, I think some people might forget there were two other people injured in that shooting. And that was Secret Service agent Tim McCarthy and D.C. police officer Thomas Delahanty. But like I said, everybody remembers where they were when this news broke. Take a look. like yesterday honestly it really does gosh I look at those pictures and I really feel like it was just yesterday but it was not it was four decades ago um, what's so fascinating about this crime America was transfixed understandably so John Hinckley for his part within the next three years would try to kill himself three different times and in June of 1982 he raised the not guilty by reason of insanity defense and um, was committed. He was successful. The jury found he was not guilty by reason of insanity, and he was committed to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Parents' visits began just four years later, very, very short, supervised by hospital staff visits to his parents. And over the course of the next several decades, those visits would expand, and then they'd become unsupervised. And that happened. Uh, from 1986 all the way through till 2016. At that point, he was released from the hospital with conditions. And then just last September, he petitioned to have all the conditions um, abolished and removed. That, we don't have an update on that yet, but it would be really fascinating to know that somebody who tried to assassinate the President of the United States uh, is just out there living among us like everyone else because the, the notion here is that if you are sick, eventually you can become better. And that's what the professionals over the years and years and years, 38, if you're counting, have come to uh, decide. But Vinny, what happened here with America, when that not guilty verdict rang out, people freaked out. And I use that as a legal term because it had reverberations not only for, for the federal statutes, but also the state statutes. Uh, the feds passed the Insanity Defense Reform Act in 1984. It's just uh, three years after the shooting. And it was to basically change the rules for mental illness defendants in federal crimes. And the states got stricter, too, pretty much right across the board, or just abolished, you know, the, that statute altogether, the insanity defense altogether. Idaho, Montana, Utah, Kansas, no insanity defense in those states. Um, but, you know, when you think about insanity, it's hard for people to stomach the concept, especially when somebody seems fine in court. It's all about what you were at the time of the crime. Could you actually have been insane at the time of the crime and then been fine later on? Uh, you have to determine whether you were insane at the time of the crime, not how you were in court. That's very difficult for jurors. But effectively, this is what most states follow. In fact, about half the states employ this rule, and the other half the states employ a rule that's sort of similar. It's called the McNaughton Rule, uh, that the defendant really didn't know the nature and quality of the act, or if he did, or she did, uh, did not know that what they were doing was wrong. And many of the states also employ another little added uh, you know, aspect to this, that you would have had to have had a mental disorder um, at some point and be treated as well. But there you go. Those are, those are sort of the, the core um, 
you know, the, the core aspects of the laws across the states that do have an insanity defense. But I always think back to Hinckley as the granddaddy, don't you, Vinny? Oh, absolutely. And I think not only do the laws change, but I think the public's perception and reaction to it. I mean, jurors hate that defense. I mean, they just hate that defense. You know, in my time at Court TV, the first insanity trial that I covered as a correspondent was up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 2002, Michael Mucko McDermott. And wow, I'll never forget that, that case. Horrific, horrific crime. And, and I know you know this story very well as, as well. I always think of that uh, story, particularly because he took the stand, and you don't typically see that with an insanity defense. You don't typically see someone take the stand. But for those who don't remember, this is a great case, a really good one to brush up on. Michael McDermott uh, was employed at a place called Edgewater Technology uh, and back in December of 2000. In fact, it was uh, December 26th, day after Christmas, um, in 2000. He walked into that company. And he unloaded 37 rounds into seven of his coworkers. He used an AK-47, a 12-gauge shotgun, and a 32 pistol. And he killed seven of them. And um, when he went to trial, I think this is what sort of shocked so many people, he invoked a story saying, I'm not guilty by reason of insanity because I was born without a soul. And God promised me that I could earn a soul. Um, but I would have to travel back in time and I would help to kill Nazis. I'm not making this up. In fact, why don't you listen to Michael McDermott on the stand yourself. So there was a, a room from which I could feel Hitler's thoughts emanating. And I you knew could, he was you could hiding. What? You could what? I could feel his thoughts emanating from that room. So what did you do then? So I went there. There was a, a door in the way. I knew it was locked. So I uh, blew the lock out of the door with a shotgun. I went inside the room. There were two men and a woman there. There was a woman uh, hiding under a desk. The last Nazi was there. I shot and killed him. And Hitler was there. I shot and killed him. What did you then do? The mission was complete. I knew at this point I had a soul. And I was being as careful as I could to try and minimize any sin that I might commit from that point on. So I went back to the first room at the other end of the bunker and sat down. Eventually guards came in, dragged me off, and eventually later that day died. Where did you die? At a police station in Berlin. Yeah, no. Um, no, the jury wasn't buying it because the prosecution was very effective in pointing out a couple of key issues in Michael McDermott's case, and that was that he... Um, was kind of angry with his employer for garnishing as he owed back taxes to the IRS. And then, oh yeah, there was that research he did online on how to fake a mental illness. That stuff never works. He was found guilty of seven counts of first degree murder and he was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole. Consecutive, not concurrent, just in case. But that one's always a fascinating one. Gets people angry too. Yeah, and, and, you know, his look with that hair, um, what the uh, deputies told me, that when they put him in the holding cell, he would, he would put his hair back. It was all for show. When, well, when the jury yeah, was I in mean, the courtroom, he would, he would sit there and read, read his Bible, and then when the jury right. wasn't there, he would be perfectly normal. I mean, right, before he ever got to the jury, it was all for show. He's researching how to fake a mental illness. Those either, these are the people that give this uh, defense a bad name, and I say that because there are some cases that really – you know, are deserving of, of this particular defense, Vinny, and you and I have covered them. Yeah, uh, some of them. Um, have, what about Jeffrey Dahmer? I mean, huh. everyone's, you look, you look at that case and you think, this guy has to be, has to be mentally ill to do what he does, but um, is he legally insane, right? Yeah, so I think that's a really great example because how can you not be absolutely out of your mind to do what Jeffrey Dahmer did. And for those uh, at the end of the age of 40, maybe who don't know all the details of Jeffrey Dahmer, he murdered uh, 17 young men between uh, the years 1978 and 1991. Uh, in 1992, he was convicted for 15 of those in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The way he would uh, go about prosecuting these crimes was that he would have... Um, he would lure these young men back to his apartment with the promises of uh, sex and drugs and all sorts of, you know, money and that sort of thing. And then he would strangle them. 
and then he would have sex with their corpses and then for good measure he would cut them up and keep skulls and genitals as souvenirs um, but he would also eat parts of his victims so this was just about as bad as it gets the worst of the worst you know um, he pleaded guilty by uh, reason of insanity or not guilty by reason of insanity rather in 1992 but um, in order for the jury in Wisconsin to have bought into that 10 of them 10 jurors only not 12 would have had to agree that Dahmer suffered from a mental disease that prevented him from knowing right from wrong or being able to control his actions so I want you to see two things I want you to see Jeffrey Dahmer also took the stand and talked about his illness and then I want you to see one of his victims family members who lost it in court Take a look. this was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate I hated no one I knew I was sick or evil or both now I believe I was sick the doctors have told me about my sickness and now I have some peace. I know how much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. My name is Rita Isbell, and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Jer whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. Do I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you. You know, I can't say that I wouldn't do the exact same thing that she did in that courtroom. We all think, oh, look at that behavior. But imagine that this is your family member that he did this to. Um, and that might have been one of the reasons why the jury just could not come to a not guilty by reason of insanity for Jeffrey Dahmer. They probably thought he was absolutely crazy. But they didn't decide that he was legally insane. They said he was legally sane and that he did not suffer um, from a mental disease interesting they said he planned in advance he wasn't sick he was sentenced to life in prison but he didn't get to live out his life in prison because a fellow inmate killed him in 1994 I remember that news and shockwaves throughout the legal community didn't it Vinny oh absolutely and, and you, know, you, you go back to that case and it, it, it demonstrates how difficult it is to prove and and everyone has to remember that you know mental illness is a medical condition right but Insanity is a legal term, so there's there, there's always always a difference. Um, how about another mass shooting, uh, Navid Hak? This was one yeah, we, uh, in Seattle at the Greater Jewish uh, Federation. Yeah, we covered this uh, gavel to gavel on uh, on Court TV. I remember it well. I sat through every moment of that trial. He came in every day, and for most of the trial, he sat there looking catatonic. I think at one point he was even drooling. Uh, this was a man on July 28th of 2006 who went into the uh, Jewish Center and shot it up. I mean, he just uh, went ballistic. He was charged with nine felonies, including aggravated murder, five counts of attempted murder, kidnapping, burglary, malicious harassment, which is a hate crime in Washington State. They decided, the prosecutors um, in Washington State, not to seek the death penalty. And maybe it's because they realized this man was really, really sick. And I will tell you, I don't know that I've ever seen another trial uh, where I believed wholeheartedly this man was the epitome of the insanity defense, just so incredibly sick. Um, the first trial ended in this trial, though, interestingly enough. And then in 2009, he ended up being found guilty on all counts. The jury just wasn't ready to accept the attorney's argument that, um, that he was criminally insane. They just couldn't do it. But that he had a history of mental health treatment his parents pleaded with with the jury and with the court please my son has been so sick we have tried everything he's been in and out of every institution he's been medicated he goes on and off the medic he's just such a sick sick man but it just didn't work it just didn't work yeah I'm always skeptical of those defendants though when they have the insanity defense and they have no history of mental illness and I'm like all right what, what exactly is going on here um, two 
others that remind me probably the most of all are mm. two other mothers from Texas, Deanna Laney and um, Andrea Yates, which was probably yeah. one of the biggest ones I ever covered. But uh, these two, um, probably the most similar to, to Lori Bell in, in some aspects. In some aspects without the cult. Um, so let's start with uh, with uh, Andrea Yates. Oh, gosh, look at her. I just, oh, I get so sad when I see that face and those children. So let's start with Andrea Yates. Uh, she confessed to drowning all five of those children, the oldest of them just seven. The youngest was just a baby. Um, June 20th, 2001, I remember I was on the air at MSNBC, and it crossed the wire, and I couldn't speak seeing this story. I couldn't believe it was true. She suffered terribly from postpartum depression. She also suffered from postpartum psychosis and schizophrenia. And during her first trial, which was in 2002, the DA did not care. Uh, he probably looked at this picture and other pictures of these beautiful, smiling little babies and said, to hell with it. I'm going for the death penalty. And he did. Um, the jury found her guilty. Capital murder. But then the jury didn't feel maybe the same way the DA did, and they did not give her the death penalty in that case. Instead, they said life in prison and um, 40 years. She was going to have the opportunity for parole in 40 years. So maybe they thought, listen, this woman's really, really sick, but we can't stand the concept of five babies. By the way, those children were all held under the bathtub looking at her. One of the children had um, her hair, or her, the children's hair was in her hand. It was just a horrifying case. She laid them all out on her bed after they were drowned as well, and then called her husband to say, come home from work. Uh, so that was, that was Andrea. The verdict, however, was overturned. This was the most amazing part of this case, because one of the um, expert witnesses had said something on the stand that hadn't happened. It was He was referencing a TV show, saying Andrea was following uh, the plot of this TV show, but the TV show had not aired yet, so that was impossible. So her verdict was overturned. She had a second trial completely, and the second jury said, you know what? You're right. She is not guilty by reason of insanity. She was committed to the hospital in Kerrville, Texas. That's where Deanna Laney was committed as well, because she huh, killed two of her babies by smashing their heads with rocks because she was so incredibly sick and mentally deranged. The third baby didn't die. Um, she said that God had told her to, to kill those sons, and, and even all five of the mental health experts said 100%. She suffers from psychotic delusions, and, and she was also given a not guilty by reason of insanity and committed for eight years, but she was released in May of 2012. Deanna Laney was released in 2012. Andrea Yates, no, she is still wow. committed. Yeah. I didn't realize that about Deanna Laney. I remember that yeah. trial, though, where uh, experts from both sides agreed prosecute the case, just let the jury decide. It really didn't argue, um, you know, as vigorously as prosecutors yeah. usually do. But Vinny, can Ashley I just Banfield, say one more thing real quickly? Best? Honestly, I, I sure. think we turned the corner a little bit since Hinckley. Look, we're, we're four decades since Hinckley when everybody went nuts about the death penalty, about the um, insanity defense. And mental illness has become a real issue in our society now. It is far more understandable uh, when people have mental illness now. It is not a bad word. It is not a phony baloney thing. And I think we may be in another direction because I think people do really understand these are true and honest sicknesses. Um, they're not just some mamby pamby made up story. Yeah, and I've seen more jurisdictions with guilty but mentally ill, yes. which is you know, less than murder but not quite legal insanity. It's kind of in the middle where people uh, are found guilty but are treated differently than other inmates.